So I'd like to welcome everyone today to the IPERG webinar, the first for 2022. And we've got Dennis Yemshinov today, I hope I've got that correct, um, who's been speaking about bi-level governance and pest survey campaigns. How can game theory help? Now, um, I'm just going to ask everyone, I think you're mostly all there, um, to mute yourself while Dennis is speaking so we don't have distractions of keyboards and um, random people coming into the room. And yeah, uh, welcome Dennis and thank you very much for speaking to us. I'm sharing my screen. I uh, hope everyone can see. Uh, there is a message somebody wants to get admitted. Okay. Uh, let's start. Uh, many optimization models and decision support tools are now available uh, to assist with the planning of invasive species detection and surveillance. Typically, uh, decision support tools assist a single decision maker uh, who plans uh, a pest survey in the area of concern, uh, for example, you know, a province or a state or a portion of the country. In real life, pest survey decisions can be made at different levels. Uh, an example of hierarchical planning include uh, decisions at the level of European Union made by European Food Safety Authority and EU member countries, or for example, in the United States uh, at the level of uh, state or planning of uh, states versus county level planning. Uh, the planners at different government levels may act with a little or no coordination and follow uh, different goals and have different levels of expertise. And the question is how we can account for these differences in a multi-level uh, survey uh, planning. In this study, we explore an idea of invasive species surveillance planning at two governance level. We consider a central agency tasked with uh, delimiting the extent of invasion uh, and reporting it to the public. This could be a federal or provincial or state agency looking for a big picture and delimiting uh, the places, for example, townships in Canada or United States uh, where um, invasive species uh, is detected. The central agency allocates the budget to inspect sites for the signs of uh, infestation across a large area. We also consider regional government. In our theoretical ex example, counties, but this could be also different jurisdictions. As a cost-cutting uh, measure, the central agency may consider uh, allocating a small portion of funds to regional governments to conduct surveys. Uh, county planners may have better local knowledge of uh, distribution of susceptible host, and the survey cost may be lower for some locations than the cost of uh, to the central agency. However, county planners' objectives may differ from the central agency objective because counties may seek information uh, beyond the just presence of the past. They may seek information like population densities because density determines local response decisions. We start with uh, formulating a basic, very basic problem for uh, surveillance, for detection for the central agency planner. The survey area with host trees is divided into a number of counties and each county includes several townships. Uh, local county governments, if they have funds, can make independent survey decisions uh, where to inspect sites. For each site with a host trees, which is black dots on the map, we estimate the likelihood of infestation uh, using the pest dispersal model calibrated by prior records of the pest spread. 
We depict the uncertain knowledge about invasion as a set of discrete stochastic scenarios, set S, based on the estimated invasion probabilities. And our central agency planners uh, problem one maximizes the expected number of townships with positive detections over area, uh, over all infestation scenarios, subject to the budget constraint. In short, the goal is to detect infestations in as many townships as possible. Uh, the central agency may allocate a portion of the survey funds to regional governments as a cost-cutting measure. After receiving the funding, the county planner uh, conducts a survey to detect the pest presence in, uh, in the area. If the pest is found in a particular site, then county inspectors want to proceed with more detailed survey to assess the density of pest population. The county needs to know the population density to decide on local response action. Note that uh, the second survey is conditional on the probability of detecting the pest, uh, and uh, so is the inspection cost. Essentially, if uh, pest is detected, then there will be more thorough survey, uh, which will cost more. We assume that a site can be inspected by either central agency or county inspectors, but not by both. Uh, the problem is uh, that uh, the model two is unrealistic because it assumes that a uh, cost sharing strategy would follow a uh, central planners, a uh, central planning agency objective. And it's not true because counties follow their own objective. So how we can detect this, uh, how, how can we account for that? The county planner seeks information about pest population density, which translates into different objective. Uh, the county planner maximizes the number of sites with estimated pest density, uh, because the uh, uh, second survey is conditional on detection of the pest. They need to uh, the second survey to estimate the density. And formally, they maximize uh, the number of site, expected number of sites with uh, completed second survey, which is equivalent to maximizing the expected number of inspected sites with pos positive detections. And again, this is theoretical model, but it's totally unrealistic because it assumes that county planners would strictly follow the central uh, agency objective, which is not true. How we can solve the problem for central agency planner uh, and anticipate that counties will follow their own objectives if they are given funds. Uh, ideally, a central agency planner need to anticipate that county planners will be maximizing different objectives and each county will have to maximize their own objective. So it will be 10 different counties and they will be maximizing 10, they own 10 different objectives. The model can be solved by using a game theory approach. And we formulate the problem as a leader followers Stackelberg game where one player, the leader moves first and other players, followers, respond. And central agency planner is a leader and allocates the surveillance budget and may allocate some funds to the selected counties. County planners are the followers and they are receiving funds from the leader and maximize their own objectives. We need to solve the game from the leader's perspective. That is allocating some funds, if any, to the counties, assuming that they will maximize their own objectives. We solve this game uh, using a B-level optimization in two steps. First, for each county, we discretize all possible uh, budget levels the county may receive from the central agency, including zero budget. Then we compute uh, the optimal solutions for each county planner for all funding possibilities he may receive from the leader and store these locations of the inspected sites for the solutions in a binary parameter. Then we use this binary parameter to solve the central agency problem by choosing 
between discrete budget allocations uh, to the counties based on their pre-computed optimal solutions. The reason why we use this uh, B-level uh, optimization because the county level uh, problem is a mixed integer programming problem. And the only way to solve it through this B-level approximation, and this is what we did. And for those, and I know there are a couple of people who really like equations, um, for those who wants to see equations, that's basically the formulation of the uh, B-level model. And uh, the objective is the same as in previous two models. Uh, and where, when the central agency planner allocates a portion of funds to some counties and uses the rest uh, of the budget to do their own service. And uh, we saw this model in linear programming environment. And uh, let's now have a look how the practical results may look. Uh, we applied this model to uh, explore the potential strategies for delimiting service of hemlock woolly at Delgit in Ontario, Canada. Uh, the pest kills hemlock trees uh, and was introduced in the United States in mid 50s. Several in infestations have been recently detected in Niagara Peninsula, Canada, and the spread is driven by migratory birds, but infested nursery stock may also be a vector. The model needed estimates of spread probabilities as a function of distance. We used dispersal kernel from Fitzpatrick's paper to estimate the probabilities of the pest spread as a, at a site as a function of distance to infestation. And we use these estimates to generate two groups of scenarios. Uh, there are no uncertainty solutions based on the actual spread probabilities and the uncertainties solutions based on 3.6 thousand stochastic spread scenarios based generated from estimated probabilities. The model also required some other data, uh, specifically maps of townships and counties and sites with hemlock presence. The map of hemlock host was built by Dr. Kat Kathleen Ryan, and we defined the survey sites at uh, one kilometer hexagonal grid. Baseline detection probability was set to 0 0.63 based on published work. Uh, the inspection costs were based on typical travel and inspection times in Southern Ontario, including traffic speeds in large urban areas. So we did uh, calculate shortest path distances between all pairs of sites across Southern Ontario and we queried Google Maps for many, many uh, times to estimate the average uh, uh, traffic speeds. Uh, and Google gives this uh, capacity, but it's just a very painful uh, manual, uh, manual operation. And uh, we use this to calculate the travel distances and uh, inspection costs. For the central agencies, the travel cost to the service sites were estimated from the nearest regional offices. And for the county inspectors, the travel times were estimated uh, from the largest municipality in the county. Now, these are our first results. I'm only showing the slide with the survey allocations for 20,000 budget. Uh, the other budgets show somewhat similar allocations. Uh, let's uh, have a close look at this slide. The left panel shows no uncertainty solutions based on a single scenario. The right panel shows the uncertainty solutions. Uh, without uncertainty, single level and B-level solutions, which is uh, black and uh, red uh, labels, uh, they show little difference. Central agency planner inspects the sites with highest risk of infestation and closes to the regional offices. Counties are allowed to inspect lower risk sites in close proximity to the locations of the office, county offices. So the uh, travel distances and uh, survey costs are the lowest. Uh, the uh, upper row, the first row shows uh, allocations by central agency. The 
second row shows allocations by county in the single level and b-level problems again single level problem two is a problem which allows cost sharing but forces counties to follow a central agency objective so this is a theoretical upper bound for the best possible survey solution and b-level problem three this is our game theoretic problem uh, the third row shows two specific scenarios where uh, problem one is where a central agency serves uh, by themselves and doesn't share the cost with the counties. And uh, the county service only, this is a, also a theoretical problem when uh, all funds are allocated to counties and they maximize their own objectives. So this is just a theoretical problem to, to uh, estimate the objective value for the counties. The most interesting scenario is in under red outline is our um, B level problem three under uncertainty. The uncertainty scenarios show that both central and county planners inspect a larger area to hedge against uncertainty, the uncertain long distance uh, detections. And B level model solutions show more sites and larger area inspected by the central agency and fewer sites and fewer sites inspected by the counties. In this graph uh, on the left, we show the objective value from the perspective of the central agency planner uh, as a function of the budget. And the shape of the graph uh, shows uh, the rule of diminishing returns. That is, the marginal increase in the detection capacity is highest at the lowest budget levels. We also see that can see that B-level model performs uh, slightly worse than theoretical single-level model, and this is because the central agency planner anticipates the underperformance of county planners when they are allocated funds. The graph on the right shows the budget portion allocated to the central agency inspectors versus total budget. Basically, what central agency keeps for themselves uh, to ins do inspections. Uh, blue lines show the single scenario uh, solutions and red lines show uh, um, uh, uncertainty scenarios. Uh, the uncertainty solutions, let's look at uncertainty solutions. The uncertainty solutions allocate more funds to county inspectors than no uncertainty solutions. The reason why, because the uncertainty solutions depict the detection of rare events in individual scenarios, and the solution is generated with respect to all possible uh, scenarios, which is 3.6 thousand stochastic scenarios. In the uncertainty solutions, B-level solutions allocate a lower budget portion to county planners because the central agency anticipate against the underperformance of the county inspectors because they have different goals. Uh, most interesting part is uh, the allocations in B-level model solutions at low budgets, the blue arrow. Uh, at, when the budget level is very low, almost no funds are allocated to counties and almost 100% 100 of funds used by central agency. Uh, it is only when the budget is large enough to inspect all high risk sites uh, around the infestation, a portion of funds can be allocated to regional uh, planners. The, uh, in our case uh, of Hemlock Woolley at Delzit, the infestation is small, and uh, the, the number of sites to inspect is still relatively small with high risk of infestation. Therefore, uh, it only needs a small budget to inspect them all. And then once uh, in, uh, a survey expands to a larger area, uh, we encounter more and more sites at uh, long distances from infestations with low probability of detection. And that's where uh, some sites are more effective to be uh, inspected by counties. In this uh, graphs, we show the solutions uh, 
of single level and B level problems in dimensions of the valuations for the central agency and for the county planners. X axis denotes the valuation in terms of the county planners objective. And Y axis uh, defines the valuation in terms of the central agency planners objective. Uh, theoretical single level model with cost sharing is a field circle and it performs the best in terms of the central agency uh, valuation. Uh, the cross uh, defines the uh, problem when central agency uh, inspects the uh, sites without sharing the funds with counties. And the diamond uh, depicts a theoretical situation when uh, counties are given all the funds and they follow their own objectives. So they, uh, they perform the best in terms of county valuation, but they perform the worst in terms of central agency valuation. Uh, Overall, B-level models performs uh, better than uh, the problem one when the central agency does all service. And it performs significantly better and close to the theoretical limit uh, in large budget situation. And the reason why is because in, when budget is large, a significant portion of uh, surveillance is uh, uh, happening at large distances from infestation when the probability of detection is very low. And so the conditional cost, remember the county has conditional cost of detection uh, uh, for counties is lower. And so it is optimal to include counties in the cost sharing problem. <clears throat> Uh, we also tested the impact of the survey cost and detection rates. So uh, the survey cost changed the apportionment of the um, cost between funds between allocated between central agency and county inspectors. And uh, in X axis shows a unit cost multiplier for the county survey cost. So the vertical line uh, one means equal unit cost for the county and central agency inspectors. And we can see without uncertainty, the scenario, the, the graph show a sharp switch uh, in, in the proportion of budget allocated to uh, central agency. So once county cost becomes higher than one, uh, a significant portion is switched to the central agency inspectors. However, in the uncertainty scenarios, this uh, transition is more gradual uh, because the uncertainty solutions anticipate uh, long distance rare infestations and there will be always sites with, uh, which county can inspect at lower cost than the central agency inspectors. Uh, the sensitivity analysis to the detection rate uh, shows roughly the same uh, results. Um, as uh, you could see, uh, uh, the ver uh -huh, vertical line indicates equal detection rates for county and the central agency inspectors, which is uh, 0 0.63. Uh, this is our base detection rate. And once uh, the county detection rate exceeds the uh, central uh, agency detection rate, uh, the proportion of the budget allocated to central agency inspectors uh, drops. And again, this transition is more gradual in, more in the uncertainty scenarios. Uh, also, you could see that B-level model three allocates a larger portion of funds to the central agency inspector. Again, this difference compared to the theoretical model is because a B-level model anticipates underperformance of counties because they uh, follow slightly different objectives. Overall, our approach can be used to find cost-effective collaboration service strategies between federal and regional governments. The approach can help explore cost-sharing strategies in other governance hierarchies, for example, between federal and state or federal and provincial governments 
or between the programs managed by European Food uh, Safety Authority and EU uh, member countries. Uh, I think uh, the game theoretic approach can uh, help explore even more complex hierarchies as long as we can formulate the objectives and uh, place uh, give appropriate uh, placement for the players. For delimiting service of hemlock woolly at Delgit in Ontario, the solutions which share the budget with regional government had lower efficiency because counties aimed to estimate the densities of pest populations, which is which central agency doesn't need. Central again, central agency needs a big picture, basically the map of township with uh, positive or negative detections of the pest. And B level solutions allocate central agency service to the most riskiest uh, moderate cost sites and let counties to inspect sites with high cost to central agency and low uh, probabilities of infestation. I think we can also uh, explore how insufficient information about regional government objectives uh, can impact the decision at the central agency level. And this could be the focus of future work. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, now, what we're going to do is that Frank <coughs> is going to take questions. Um, I haven't been keeping an eye on the chat, so if you've popped a question in the chat, we'll pick that. Um, pick that up. And otherwise, yeah, any questions? You can either put them in the chat or just switch your microphone uh, on. Just uh, read me the chat. Yeah, I, I try not to <laughs> change. Okay. <laughs> Go, okay. Andrew. So, Andrew has a question, but he doesn't want to type it. <laughs> okay, that, we give you the floor. Oh, thank you. Uh, Dennis, that's a, a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, it did my old statistician's heart good to see the, uh, the treatment of uncertainty in, in optimization. Congratulations. Um, I have two. I have a question. Uh, two questions, if I may. About I'll ask one, and then I'll cede the floor, and then ask the other one later on. Could you go back to slide twelve, please? Okay, give me a second. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> The, the graph on the right-hand side, budget percentage allocated to central agency inspectors, uh, is very jiggly. And I am struggling to understand intuitively why this bounces around so much. Do you have any insight as to that? Yes, I do. Unfortunately, this is a precision issue. And the limitation of the linear programming solver we use Remember, uh, as you can see, uh, there, there is some uh, very low probabilities. If you uh, remember the formulation, we use, uh, we formulate what's called probability of not detecting the pest in a particular site. And because the kernel is essentially local, so it's mostly a local dispersal. So for many, many sites, the value of probability of not detecting uh, the pest is very close to one. And uh, you have a vast majority of sites with this uh, extremely close probabilities of not detecting uh, the pest close to one. And that I think uh, what linear programming solver doesn't like. Another issue uh, is that what I didn't show in the uh, presentation is that uh, the equations, constraint equations are non-linear. So we linearize them with using piecewise, linear, piecewise linearization, but as you are aware of any piecewise linearization, it usually gives a bit of like error, especially if you have such extreme values very close to one or very close to zero. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this is the kind of nature of this model uh, and I was, uh, uh, I, I expect this could be different if we had a more aggressive infestation, 
which spreads over larger distances. So you have, for example, like emerald ash borer or something which would be uh, given uh, higher probabilities of detection at longer distances from the infestation. And this would give you a smoother response because the linearization would place uh, this uh, piecewise uh, kind of uh, piecewise uh, formulation in an optimal kind of uh, range of values. And right now, I believe that is caused because just we have just too many uh, cells uh, with uh, very low probability of infestation. And that kind of precipitates to other things. For example, I always used quad precision to solve this because uh, at the single precision, you see some uh, um, elements and some indication that there are some numeric issues and solver is struggling with this numeric issues. For example, it tightens, it tightens uh, Markovitz uh, threshold. It uh, automatically switches to qu uh, quad precision. You could see it takes very long to uh, go through the barrier algorithm. And I think that's what really causes this issue. Because we let it run for a long time, but I think, uh, and another problem, we don't have that many infested sites. And so the high risk zone is uh, pretty small. And this uh, apportionment, uh, which means all budgets above three, 4,000, this is about to allocate service to this very low probability sites where you have probability of infestations very close to zero. And in fact, let me show the kernel and it will explain why things happen in, in such a way. Hold on, doesn't want to uh, just give it a, okay. Sure. Here we go. Oh, I overshoot. Yeah, uh, uh, if you can see uh, the kernel is basically goes close to zero pretty quickly after 20, 25 kilometers. And that's, that's, uh, that's the, basically the nature of dispersal process. And uh, if we use a uh, longer distance, uh, like a, uh, uh, kernels, which uh, higher probability of spread over long distance, I think we would have a smoother uh, results. So, so presumably that's easy to test. I mean, you, you've chosen the kernel, so you could just make a new pest that has a different kernel and a different uh, infestation pattern uh, and then uh, run the optimization and, and verify that the lines are smoother um, under the conditions that you specify? In fact, we did, we did. But I did, just didn't show it because uh, what I found, you really need to bump it up quite a bit, the, the long distance dispersal to make it nice and smooth. And this is something I, I kind of, I'm reluctant to share because I, don't, I just cannot come up with a species which would be, aggressively dispersing over long distance. So we decided to uh, keep the results to hemlock woolly adelgid only. Thank you, thank you. I, had, I do have another question, but I'll cede the floor and we can come back to us. I mean. Um, yeah, uh, so Dennis Emily hopes she says thanks, she has to run. Um, Barney says, to some of us, 25 kilometers is long distance dispersal, and that's a fair point. I, I think of it more like in the the in ecological terms, like how much will you is not the best test case because it's a passive disperser. And so unless you have birds in this case or humans that are really at a high rate creating a, a, a differently shaped kernel, I mean... You know, it's just it's just not ideal. One we could look at, Dennis, is say something like spotted lanternfly, or I mean, I don't want to look at I'm emerald ash borer because so many people have looked oh, at it. Yeah, but, actually, spotted yeah. lanternfly. Yeah, that's a it's a better example. Or if we have a stronger and better documented uh, probabilities of human mediated dispersal, then then we will have a fatter tail of the kernel. But overall, uh, like in case of um, hemlock woolly adelgid, um, 
this is uh, you could see the probability jumps to close to zero very quickly and the survey uh, covers all southern ontario which is many hundreds kilometers and uh, this is why i think the solar was struggling with this very low numbers close to zero yeah um darren mentions brown marmorated stink bug and I'm going to shut up because Barney has his hand raised. So you have the floor, Barney. Oh, thank you. Um, Dennis is, I, I kind of echo Andrew's sentiments in that I, I appreciate the devotion to uh, realism here, but I think you may learn quite a bit by kind of going more theoretical and divorcing yourself from, you know, specifying any one particular insect and just kind of, you know, testing the, the limits across the different factors. So uh, I look forward to that. Um, on methods, we've recently started looking at um, strategies for area-wide surveying. And I was curious about your cost estimation. How much, I, I assume there's a pretty, fair correlation between just the ideal travel distance versus maybe the the cost you get when you also estimate the the speed that you can move across that uh across that that map but i wanted to ask you that question in other words well what, what it, it, how, how beneficial is putting those speeds on there apart from just looking at the bare distance it is quite beneficial because what happened before we started accounting for uh, traffic speeds, uh, the model placed a lot of service in greater Toronto area because it was relatively close uh, nearby. But once we started uh, uh, our accounting for heavy, slow traffic in greater Toronto area, when car gets stuck for an hour, then models started uh, uh, behaving differently and tried to avoid this congested areas and try to place the survey just as close as possible to uh, the greater Toronto area, but uh, not inside the like uh, heavily populated areas where you have congested traffic. And in fact, a Southern Ontario is known for heavy traffic uh, in the greater Toronto area. And uh, we felt we need to account the possible uh, traffic times because uh, you cannot compare the speed of car. Mostly uh, inspectors are driving the, the cars to get to the sites and you cannot compare um, like um, the speed driving on the regular uh, provincial highway where there's almost no vehicles versus congested traffic in, in greater uh, urban areas where like small or like a heavy traffic in the populated places. And it does make impact. The problem is we don't have um, the all detailed uh, estimates of traffic because we use manual queries of Google Maps. And of course, we just divided the area into uh, congested areas, less congested areas, and did manually uh, queries. And uh, Google gives you average uh, speeds. You, you just query a distance, and it gives you average uh, time to get between point A and, and B. And that's how you calculate the distance uh, and uh, the traffic uh, time, uh, the, the, the driving time and drive, driving speeds. But overall, uh, you know, if we had a more precise uh, traffic uh, data, uh, traffic speed data, that probably would help. Another limitation is that we uh, estimated traffic uh, and uh, survey times using the shortest path between two, two locations, the office and uh, the survey site. And sometimes uh, roads, we factor in the presence of road. So we, we use what's called minimizing resistance uh, model. But uh, in reality, people may just use their own driving uh, patterns and driving uh, roads 
So this may be also uh, uh, need further attention. All right, Dennis got another question, or actually I'm gonna give the floor to Nicolas. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Frank. Uh, hi, Dennis. Uh, I was wondering, watching your talk, uh, whether that could be, or the approach could be applicable to the early detection of uh, recently established pests. Uh, we have that issue in New Zealand where when we tend to to have our, our surveillance networks um, based on, on models that basically work on entry points being all around ports and urban areas. And that means the central government makes a push to move most of the surveillance resources uh, to, to, to these few areas and, and basically removing civilian resources from, from the forests, which are the threatened areas. So uh, I was wondering if, if that kind of approach could be suitable to, um, let's say, define kind of optimal allocation between um, allocating resources in entry points that are pointed as high risk sites for entries versus forest, which is more uh, low risk uh, and, and uncertain. Um, yeah, we can do this um, as possible. As long as you can come up with a uh, dispersal model, the probability to estimate somehow the probability of detection uh, as a function of spatial attributes and distance, etc. The approach is applicable. Uh, the, 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 another thing uh, that a game theoretic approach assumes a specific uh, cost sharing structure. So in our case, we assume that we have a higher level government agency uh, who uh, can use a portion of funds to do their own surveys and allocate a portion of funds to the lower level governments to help with the service. For example, in cooperative service of to counties or to, low, to lower like a, a regional governments. So that's the second aspect of our work. And if you, your government structure, like the, the governance structure is similar or some kind of can be tailored to 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 this setup then yes ap approach is applicable so basically if you have a like a central central agency who may distribute funds to uh, regional uh, authorities but also has their own capacity to inspect the model can help understand how much and where the government central government should allocate to regions and which portion it should keep to themselves to do the service. And it also depends on the survey capacity because what we also tested, but I didn't present, we tested the, uh, the survey, surveyor's capacity. So at each regional office, we may just not have enough inspectors to uh, inspect all uh, sites we want to inspect. And in this I'm case, in cooperation webinar. really helped because this deficiency mm -hmm. in personnel can be filled by inspectors from the regional authorities. But again, there is also a question of a detection rate and uh, experience. So if we talk about uh, hiring untrained uh, inspectors by regional authorities, the inspector inspection uh, capacity will be poorer. And uh, obviously the efficacy of this of funding scheme would be low. So there are a lot of moving parts into this in this model. And uh, of course, we, we can try different theoretical scenarios. Uh, I wanted to make comments uh, to Barney's uh, idea of using theoretical scenarios. Yes, we, we seriously thought about this, but uh, it's just easier to uh, present the study using the practical example. Practical best example. Uh, the theoretical study could be just too theoretical and some, some readers may not find it interesting. So we always try to use a practical best example. 
Um, yeah, so Dennis, uh, the, um, we have a question from Darren. Um, uh, I, I think it's, it's related. Um, yes, th there is a cost sharing between the central government yeah. and in this case, the forest um, industry. So that, yeah. that's why I was asking the question as okay. well, because uh, here in this case, it's the forestry industry and, and the forest owners um, that could be seen like, like the local, uh, local authorities. I, I mean, I would think you could do just about anything since the Stackelberg game is set up as leader follower, as long as you can define some sort of leadership, fo leader follower structure, I mean, you could test just about anything. Um, I, I'm going to go yeah. out a little bit. So, Dennis, can I go out a little bit further? Is that I'm going to go a little further because I have been thinking about this. You know, the Stackelberg game is is essentially non cooperative. Right, like there's there's a leader and there's a no, follower. No, that's you know there there's what about a cooperative game? What if you did it as a in, in cooperative, meaning that you were anticipating that there would be these coalitions that because think of that that's like in some ways even more real world. Like we see here, like if you were looking yeah, at a survey yeah. in the U.S., yeah. you might have some states that have sort of similar workflows. They might form natural coalitions and some states might form better coalitions with an agency like APHIS than others just because of the personnel because again of how they work for so um when are you going to work on that yeah that's good uh, could be interesting uh, future extension it probably will need uh, a different model. It may not uh, qualify as a Stackelberg game because uh, Stackelberg game in Stackelberg, Stackelberg game, uh, the uh, players move sequentially. Uh, but yeah, there are some uh, cooperative games we could try. And this, this could be area of future research. All right. Uh, so I have not, Nicholas. Is that a legacy hand, or are you? Is that a, a new hand up? Because I Andrew. see Andrews put his hand back up. <laughs> uh, mine is a legacy. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Yeah. Mine is, and, mine is fresh. You know, <laughs> yes. All right, Andrew. Go ahead. Uh, so Dennis, um, <clears throat> actually, it's a it, it it conveniently follows up on on Frank's question. Um, the overarching assumption of the, the model system is that all of the, the individual um, players and the leader have essentially the same objective, which is to uh, eliminate or, or constrain the invasive species. Um, I'm curious about how much the objective functions need to change. Well, I conjecture that if the objective functions change enough, then the whole system will collapse. Um, and I'm curious about where is that tipping point? Uh, and, um, you know, of course, this is germane to thinking about uh, our response to COVID. Uh, how much do the leader and the follower objective functions need to cohere in order for there to be any coherent optimization possible? Very nice question, because um, uh, in fact, it's, uh, this is something we deliberately didn't uh, address because this could get us into really deep uh, <laughs> trouble in terms of because uh, it's not just scientific trouble, no, because um, we would need to formulate this uh, tangential objectives, which in, in case of uh, this simple example, when we have uh, regional governments and central agency government, uh, the, like, it's not just about formulating objectives. We would need to formulate a range of objectives uh, such a way so almost like that, which, would, which would show ignorance of the one player versus another and uh, disagreement. And uh, for the first study, we kind of didn't feel comfortable to do this, but yes, I totally agree. It can be done. And the main challenge will be to formulate these different objectives. 
In our case, we assume oh, no, no. that. All right. Hey, Dennis, I'm going to I'm going to cut you off there. So can we uh, we have one last question and um, from from Bob, I'm going to let him ask that because uh, you and Andrew can take this offline at some point. Um, but I'm going to let you. So, Dennis, keep your answer short. Uh, Bob, you have the floor. Um, yeah, I, I liked the uh, question about the um, uh, thinking. Of, I think it was your question, Frank, about a cooperative game. And so if you have two different agencies that have uh, funding, the question is, is there some reason that they might want to share their funding to um, with each other to attain uh, some higher objective than they could if they each spent their funding independently? And um, yeah, we could solve, we could address that with a sort of a Nash bargaining game and try to identify um, um, levels of cost sharing that would make both players better off than they would if they were acting independently. Perfect. That's, uh, that's good. That's, a, that's what I was hoping. That's good. That's what I like to hear. Um, Dennis, do you have anything else? I think we're going to wrap it up so we can do a couple of closeout things. Thanks, Bob. Um, thanks, everybody, for your questions. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Great talk. Anything else, Dennis? Any final 30 seconds? He's good. Thanks, everyone, for participating and for listening. This was a fairly technical talk. And um, looking forward for uh, potential feedbacks and ideas for collaboration. Now, I think Darren had something something to say. A little update on IPERG meeting. There we go. Sorry, I was muted. Share. Uh, stop that one. Sorry, everyone. Athens meeting. Share. OK. Um, just a, it's been a long time between meetings, and this year we've decided that we are we're going to go ahead with a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, it's in Athens. What's not to love about Athens? It's the, the dates have been set the 10th to the 13th of October, so that's Monday to Thursday. Now, that dovetails with the FFIPM meeting, the Fruit Flyers IPM meeting, on the 4th of October. Uh, on the Friday. So the idea is that if, um, if you're interested in fruit fly biosecurity and pest risk, uh, pest risk management, surveillance, um, you know, those, those sorts of topics, that you can just uh, you know, stay the extra day and find out what's going on in that meeting and you know, potentially set up collaborations. It's going to be co-hosted by the Banaki Phytopathological Institute and the University of Thessaly. So the Banaki Institute is, uh, it's effectively the Greek equivalent of APHIS, if you like. So the Fruit Flies IPM project, you can find out more information uh, here. It's European research project for the protection of fruit production and trade threats posed by fruit flies. So we'd like to welcome you all uh, to that meeting. We will uh, set out a theme very, very shortly. We're just um, working that up with EFSA and, and EPO. Um, we're looking to go and make sure that the, the theme is, um, is policy relevant. And yeah, we're going to try a new model this year. So expect to see an announcement very soon. Um, happy to take uh, one question if there's a burning one. If not, then thank you everyone. And I'll hand back over to Melanie to uh, close us out. Yeah, well, I just really wanted to thank Dennis for his talk and really thank you all for your participation. Um, this is the first time we've held the meeting via Zoom. And I think it was great to actually have the, that opportunity for interaction. So 
Thank you, everybody, and I look forward to seeing you next month. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone. See you. Yeah. Thanks, Melanie. Bye. Thanks.